Hello, Commerce Creators. Welcome to this week's episode of the Commerce Connect podcast. I'm Gamal, he's Andy, and we're here to talk about the business of comics, especially for your independent and emerging publishers. Andy, how are you feeling? Feeling great. I love this topic. Well, the first topic will be probably the more fun topic because we're going to be talking about conventions. We are, because it's spring, we're heading into convention season. We're going to be splitting our efforts because I know you're going to be at a con and I'm going to be at a completely different con because convention organizers don't really coordinate with each other about when cons are going to be. So you have multiple cons usually every weekend now, between now and like, I don't know, October. So Andy, why don't you tell them where you're going to be and then I'll tell them where I'm going to be. And then yeah. we'll talk about it. Sounds good. So uh, coming up in a little over a week for me, as of this recording, um, Friday, March 31st through Sunday, uh, April 2nd, I will be at C2E2 in Chicago. Uh, I will be hosting, moderating four panels, um, two on Friday, one at 11 a.m. Comic Art Storytelling Foundations. Um, to give you that overview of what good storytellers need to do with their art. Uh, at 3.45 p.m. the same day on Friday, the 31st, Breaking Into Comics and Staying In, uh, where we offer a lot of real-world advice from comics, from working comics creators on what it takes, some strategies, and all that kind of stuff to breaking in, and what breaking in even means, because that's a whole other debate. Uh, and then on Saturday, the 1st of April, no joke, at 12.30, Comics Writing, What Makes a Great First Issue, uh, which is a super fun one. I don't, we don't usually pick that one, but I feel like it's such a good topic. And like, so I read so many first issues that don't, frankly, do a thing that you do. Mm. Uh, that's, that's an important one. And then Sunday on the 2nd at uh, 2.30, 2.15 p.m., I'm doing one on comic book and graphic novel printing. Uh, which is everything you need to know about um, a lot of the printing terms, about stuff about paper, uh, about how to get quotes, um, the different kinds of printing. So you understand when you get one quote from one and one quote from another, why they might be different and kind of why you might want to do digital printing for one, offset printing for something else, or web press for a third thing, what sort of the pros and cons of, of all those are. So four panels, and then I'll also be walking around the show floor, um, you know, Chat me, folks. Very good. Very good. Now you have the guest panelist for all four panels already lined up. I do. I do. And now you're going to ask me who they are. I don't yeah, remember yeah. who's on every single one. On the printing one, uh, I'm doing that with Travis McIntyre from Source Point Press. They, they use a lot of different printers. Um, between the other three, uh, we've got uh, artist Philip CV, artist. Um, uh, Gene Ha, um, we've got uh, Joe Schmalky, creator of Seven Years of Darkness that CEX is publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot. We got a lot of really good people. So we've got we've got in the in and I always try to find a range of of people from some folks that are a little fresher in their career to some more seasoned pros. So you get you know really good different perspectives. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm going to be in Orlando for that same weekend from the 30th to the 2nd for Megacon. Uh, I am not going to have a panel because the panel that I proposed, which is, was going to be on the impact of artificial intelligence in the comic book industry, was not accepted by the fine organizers over at Megacon. However, we did do a very in-depth um, online panel last week about that very same subject. And we had machine learning specialists and comic book attorneys and publishers and writers, um, Mark Wade, me, Andy, um, Heidi McDonald from Comics Beat, uh, Mike Martz over from um, Mad Cave. So since there won't be a panel for um, Megacon, I suggest checking out that um, video it's going to be available in the show notes, along with all of the other information 
that we talk about. But I will be on the show floor, walking around, talking to people, buying things that I don't need, um, because that's one of the things that I do when I go to Comic Con. Um, but Andy, as I don't need. there, there are just so you know, I, I did. There are some some comic creators that I should I should mention are going to be on panels. Tim Seeley of Hack Slash and Tom's mm. Mother Comics, uh, David Pipos, who just finished up his run, I think, on Savage Avengers. Uh, and Kyle Higgins of Radiant Black fame. So we got we got some pretty big name creators on there. And all of those uh all of those folks are really uh really vocal about giving really solid advice. They won't, Very good. they won't be shy. Very good. Fantastic. Um we will actually list the names of all of the participants for all the panels in the show notes so you don't have to like memorize them all. Great. Um but Andy, as a publisher what do you feel like is the the benefits of going to a convention? And I want you to actually answer this from two perspectives, from the perspective of getting a table and from the perspective of not getting a table and how that actually impacts how you actually work a convention. Yeah, uh, well, and that's a really good distinction too. So like, for example, I'm going to C2E2 and I am not going to have a table of my own. What that allows me to do is um, not spend a bunch of money on a table, uh, A, but it also means I'm not like tied to one spot. So it allows me to go out, go down to Artist Alley, talk to creators I might be interested in doing a book with, um, or go talk to other publishers, like get some, get some, uh, situational intelligence by just talking with folks you know often i talk with folks i know but you know sometimes i go to lunch you know i have a lunch meeting with somebody or or meet somebody for a drink or something and you run into other people um so the networking is a little more free willing and uh, or free going if i'm not tied to a table now mm -hmm. if i have a table and i have at least one other person with me that can man the table then we can take turns and still do a lot of those uh, sorts of things. The benefit of having a table, though, is uh, typically I would put you know product that we you know books that we produce that we publish on it, so people can see that they get more exposure. There's some sales that can be generated, mm -hmm. um, and it's a place where if you're talking to people ahead of time, you can say, "Hey, come meet me at the you know at the CEX table." Um, we're in order to make your money back on a table, you really need to have sort of like a critical mass of, of books at, at the right price points. Um, and we're still fairly early on. So we've done primarily comics themselves, which don't have the higher price points like trade paperbacks and hardcovers. So it's really difficult, even if we have a great show and we sell several hundred comics, you know, it's still probably not gonna make back the cost of the table. So conventions really, for pub, for most publishers, aren't really about making money. They can be if you start going with higher ticket items. You, you can make a little money while you're there, which is great. Um, but that's really not, like, I wouldn't, for me personally, with my kids, high school and middle school age, doing stuff all the time that I like to do on the weekends, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give that up, give my weekend up, just to make a few bucks. Um, the real value, I think, is in the networking and being able to to reconnect with people, and also, honestly, like remind people you're alive. Which after the <laughs> pandemic, um, you know, it's easy just to forget. Like, oh, right. Like, I'm mean, the last couple conventions I've gone to. That's so many times. It's like, oh, hey, you know, like, I, like our social media paths don't cross, and so it's just like out of sight, out of mind, and that's. You know, that's nothing against me. It's nothing against them. It's it's just the reality of the way social media works. True, very true. And how about what is the benefit? Because you have like four panels, and I know when you do things like New York Comic Con or San Diego, you also have about that number. What is the benefit of the panel for the emerging or independent publisher, either? the attendance or the organizing of that panel? Like what's the benefit to me doing the panel or to somebody yep. coming to the panel? You, um, you doing the panel. 
A lot of it's eyeballs. I mean, most of the panels I do really are to promote comics connection and comics experience. Um, <laughs> the, the printing one will promote ONS Printing, which is the printing company that we run. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, comics experience and comics connections about teaching folks how to make comics and how to navigate the business of comics. And so, you know, there we, we give them a taste of what that's like. And then we say like, Hey, here's a, here's a sign up sheet. Um, if you want to get an email once a month from us to let you know what's going on. But the one thing that I, that I don't want to do is I don't want to give people a tease on the panels. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that we, as, as much as you can, and whatever it is, 50 minutes, I think is all you get, but like as much as we can in 50 minutes, I try to give, try to give real information because in, in my experience, if they get something really valuable, then they'll go, Oh, I'll bet those courses are really valuable too. And, uh, and that sort of thing, but you don't get any hard sell from me. I mean, part of the reason to do it is just to inform people, like what's the road ahead of you? What's it like? And, and talk with folks like that's part of it too. It's just, there is a social aspect. A lot of, a lot of us freelancers live a, live a miserable lonely lives because we do everything out of our out of our houses we don't have an office we go to and so you know there is there is a nice like social aspect to conventions i think is is really healthy yeah i think like the conversations like you and i have on a you know once every two weeks that is a little bit of what i think you can generate from a larger panel when you have like three or four people, the benefit there is there's more there's more feedback from the the audience. People can ask the specific questions they want to ask in real time, and you get a lot of um, insights and perspectives that aren't necessarily rehearsed or planned. People will just you know in the flow of conversation, they'll just start talking and provide very solid information depending on you know, of course, who it is that you bring on the panel. When I wrote my book about um, being an independent publisher, I made the very clear distinction about tabling versus not tabling and the, the economic and the actual time impact that that decision has. But the other thing, and you actually pointed out a lot of those things in, the, in what you said, so I, didn't, I don't want to rehash that. But the one thing that I do want to add is that there is if you're an independent publisher or a freelancer or somebody who has a company that is, you know, where your all your comic book work is actually going, you need to be sure that you are using that company to leverage the tax benefits of going to conventions because a company can take business deductions for, you know, say activities and costs related to that business. Going to a convention as much fun as it is and everything else that you actually do is a legitimate business expense. So if you're, you know, take getting tables, going on trips, um, going to bar con, getting on planes, a lot of that can actually be deducted from your, the taxes of your company if you have a company and if you have that structure set up, which actually makes going to a convention much more economically feasible because you know that all that money is not just going to get dropped into a hole. Like if you are a, um, if you're just a fan of comics, you're going to a comic convention, you can't deduct that from your taxes. But if you're a professional with a company, that's something that you can actually expense, which actually takes the bite out of going to conventions so that you actually free up, you can free up some cash to actually do other things. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and it just along with that too, you mentioned like the travel, like plane tickets and hotel and stuff like that. So that's, a, that goes into a lot of my mental mm -hmm. math of whether or not I want the table. Like the minute I have to start shipping stuff to, to man, to, to put on the table and all that sort of stuff, I mean, your expenses skyrocket. Like by the time, <laughs> by the time you're all in, I mean, if you sell several hundred $20 books, like you maybe made a dollar per book. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's so one of the additional expenses that go into it. Yeah, that's one of the things that we talk about a lot in Commerce Connection because we have specific, we had specific classes on convention attendance. And because one of the benefits of having so many conventions in so many states is that no matter where you live, 
there's probably a local show or a few local shows that you can go to and significantly reduce the cost of going to that convention because there is no plane ticket, there is no hotel room there. You don't have to spend a huge amount on meals or anything else. The shipping costs are lower because you kind of put everything in your car and just drive there. Whereas the farther out you go for any given show, the more your expenses are. And once you get to things like C2E2, San Diego, New York Comic, now you're talking about a cost that it does on a certain level, if you look at your profit and loss statement for each convention, and we actually encourage all of our members to break down the cost of each convention before you make the decision to go, you realize that even if you sell a thousand books, you're not going to make back the money that you spent on that convention. Now, there's so many different benefits to going to a convention that it might be worth the that cost, even though if you don't make it back. But if you're thinking about, you know, making a profit from a convention or using conventions as your primary kind of sales tool, you have to actually consider all of the costs going to get you to the point where you're standing behind the table before you actually decide, okay, that's the way we're going to sell comics. Just something to keep in mind, in addition to the tax benefits that I talked about before. So now we're going to move on to the less fun topic. Um, we're going to be talking about macroeconomics and recessions within the context of running a publishing company. There's been a lot of articles this week probably because we're getting close to tax season, about um, from ICV2 and from Comic Speed, it's going to be in the show notes, that talking about um, the slump in sales in the direct market and how many comic book shops may or may not have closed since the end of the pandemic. Just to give a little bit of context, there was a significant spike in comic book sales during the pandemic, primarily because nobody could go anywhere and they were stuck doing things in their house. What they did in a lot of cases was reading comics. There were three broad categories that all had significant increases in sales, single issues, um, graphic novels, and back issues. Now, because those numbers are so high and what businesses do is they compare sales year to year, it makes sense that in a year where people can go outside and do things and not be stuck in the house, the activity and the spending change. So you have a lot of these um, numbers that were high in 2020 and 2021 going down in 2022. But you also have um, other recessionary pressures kicking in. The price of a lot of a lot of mandatory goods, uh, staple goods, has been going up. And when the cost of staple goods goes up, people's discretionary income goes down. And By when staple people, goods, you mean comics because they have staples, right? No, no, no. I mean things like food, uh, gas, um, utility. I do not mean oh, comics. Those things. Sure. Yeah, staples. From economic yeah. terms, I'm not talking about printing comics. I need you to focus. I need you to be right here. <laughs> uh, so discretionary income goes down, and usually for most people, comics is part of their discretionary income. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I am in a comic book business, and I need comics, so it's actually mandatory. That's fine. But most people don't have to buy comics. So if they need to pull back on something, they pull back on comics, um, which means comic sales go down, which means some stores, if they can't meet their, you know, their margins, they close. Um, Andy, you actually had a very detailed kind of breakdown about what was going on in relation to, I think, they, they, on the Discord, we were talking about Dark Horse. So I wanted you to actually share to the extent that you remember what you said share what you were talking about in terms of being able to ride out a lot of these recessionary pressures if you are an independent publisher yeah uh i pulled it up so that i wouldn't have to remember because my mind oh, is see? right now um but yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the recession is really bad. And you touched on it, but inflation is a real issue right now, too. Like, just in terms of the not just the cost of the staples, but the cost of staples, uh, going back to my lame joke, like, that's real. Like, the cost of printing has gone up. The cost of shipping has gone up. There's a dearth of, of drivers, and shipping logistics is really tough right now. So everything has gotten harder and or more expensive in the last year or two. Um, <laughs> and like you said, like people tighten their belts and they tighten their belts in different ways. Um, you know, for me, you know, I was just having this conversation earlier in the day, like I'm just not going out to eat very much. Like there's no need. It's much less expensive. It's healthier to, to cook at home. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and that's one really good, good way to cut down on our overall bills. But for the publishing business, uh, and clearly I just picked the wrong time to get into this, but the publishing business is more of a long game, right? Like, so the ideal for a publisher is to have, is to be able to print a relatively large print run of a, of a decently priced book, like let's say 15 to $20 book, because the larger the print run, the, that will reduce the cost per book. Right. Mm -hmm. so instead of paying ten dollars per book, if I if I double my print run, maybe I'm paying eight dollars per book, which just means that when I sell those books, I make two dollars more right out of the gate. Um, but of course, that means you're also spending a lot more money to print all those extra books that may take you a couple of years to sell. Mm -hmm. right? So the the you know, sort of the the opposing force on that is how much money do you have to spend? if you're spending all that additional money for stock that you make a little bit more on. So that's sort of the yin and the yang, right? Because if, you know, if I go, Hey, I'm super confident about this book. Yeah. Maybe I'll make that, that case. I'll go, okay, I'll, I'm going to double the print run on this thing. And I know I'll sell through it. But if I were to do that and play that long game for five or 10 larger books, that's going to eat up all the cash that I'm using to create new content. Mm -hmm. So now I've got a whole bunch of backstock, but I don't have anything new and I don't have anything new to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, out in the marketplace. So it becomes this real issue. Whereas if I tighten my print runs, the per unit cost goes up, there's less profit, but at least I've got cash going in and coming or coming back in when I'm spending it. So that's really the whole thing. So when we get into a situation where we are now, where sales are starting to decline, belts are tightening, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, the instinct for publishers is to reduce those costs because they're, 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 that long-term goal is getting further and further out, which is going to become, which is just going to exacerbate the, the cash flow problem. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what it, that's the deal because once you get a, a really good backlist that you can just, that people are ordering on a monthly basis, that becomes a really good revenue stream that it that becomes a cushion against market forces like this. Right. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I kind of feel like, Hey, if I can ride out this by tightening my belt too, and making really smart decisions, then when we come out of it, hopefully I'll have enough backstock that that'll start to move a little bit more quickly that we can do those bigger print runs that we can, you know, kind of do all those things. But a lot of publishers never switch to focusing on that back, on the back stock. They will stay focused on that comic that they've got coming out that week. And then the next week they're on to the new thing. The next week they're on to the new thing. And the, the problem with that is you have no cushion. You haven't diversified very much at all. And in that, those cases, those companies can have the, the tables turned on like that. Mm -hmm. um, so when sales fall, all of a sudden it's panic because they don't have a bunch of stock that's already paid for that can still earn them earn them money. And the example I used of this uh, when we were discussing on the, on the on the Discord and on the forums was was Dark Horse. Dark Horse did a really good job of getting some early hits and then taking that money and investigating in, investing it in their own properties, in creator properties, and uh, in larger print runs for books they knew would be perennial sellers hmm. now let's i know you talked about reducing the cost the per cost for printing a book if you do a larger print run how does the storage cost of that backlist factor into those uh, 
that calculation because if you do like a shorter print run, you may sell through it faster initially, which means there's nothing to store, which means there's less storage cost. But it you're but you're making less money per book because you did a um you paid more per book. But if you pay less per book, you still have to put it somewhere. Now, I guess depending on where you live and what your living situation is, it may go in your garage, which means the storage costs are zero. But at what point do you now have to factor in not just the printing and the shipping, but the storage in addition to that profit margin and how much you're actually making per book? Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can do your storage costs. Um, one is if it goes to a warehouse, they're just going to charge you per pallet per month, typically. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not a super huge cost. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that the rate of your sales, you know, are, outpace, are outpacing those storage costs. But you're getting into some real, like, like you know, some pretty complicated calculations. Um, and one of the reasons why we, after being around for a year and a half, are still keeping our print runs really tight is because we're we're only now getting enough data to start to go, oh, okay, on average, our rate of sales on our back stock trade paperbacks is X, mm -hmm. right? We're just now getting that kind of data in. Once we understand, have a, have a good handle on, on some of that information, then we can make calculations on, okay, so if we do a print run for this, we're gonna, we're gonna reduce our cost per unit by X, but we're gonna pay Y in storage fees over time what does that balance out? At what at what point does it make more sense to do that and have those books on hand and stored? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Those those calculations can get pretty complicated, which is why I hire other people to do them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately that's it. Um, if you're smaller and you've got a good relationship, whether it's with your printer or a fulfillment company or something like that, sometimes you can work out something where they're like, look, our our warehouse isn't full right now. So like we'll keep a pallet or two and not charge you for it. Right. Mm -hmm. kind of it goes. Like, like it, it, having relationships or the building relationships, if you don't have them going in already is really, really helpful because, you know, a couple of small favors along the way in these chains and, you know, you try to do favors for people back, um, you know, can, can really, make a big difference, especially when you're, when you're starting off and everything's tight. And, you know, I've been pretty open about the fact that I expect CEX to lose money for three years. Mm -hmm. At the end of three years, I want to, I, I want more money coming in on average every month and then going out. But I mean, that's not easy. Like, Hey, it's not easy to, to sit there and have conversations with your spouse. Like, Hey, we lost more money this month over and over again. <laughs> that's really fun. Um, and not easy to like stay focused on like, is this working though? Like, is it getting better? Are we mm -hmm. doing the things that are gonna lead to that eventually? Um, and those are the conversations that my wife and I have. But uh, but also too, just like, it's just, you know, <laughs> until money starts actually coming in, you're, you're the last one getting paid. You know, at least that's the way I feel right now as a publisher, but you ask any creator and publisher's the first one getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> You know, it, it's all a matter of perspective. Um, yeah. I know right now, my royalty checks out the creators uh, far outpace the amount of money we've got coming in for the same product. Well, the, well, the other thing, and I want to go back to the uh, one of the original statements you made is that it is publishing comics is a long game. The idea that somebody is going to make a book in January and of 2023 and then be profitable in 2023 is highly unlikely. And even like what you said about, you don't even have the data to make decisions to understand whether you're profitable or not for two, three years down the line because that data, it takes a while to come in. It's not, it's not a real time statistic. So we talk about this a lot in Comics Connection about if you're making comics and your plan is to be a publisher or to be a, you know, do even do create your own books long term, you have to actually think about it not as what's going to be happening 
this year or this quarter. It's what's going to be happening two years from now, four years from now, eight years from now, and then make your decisions based on that. What I talk about, especially when we talk about recessions in comics, there's three things that you can build at any given time to improve your comic book business. You can build the stories that are in your comics. You can build the community of people who are interested in and reading your comics, or you can build the sales. And in a period where you have a recession, the sales are probably not going to build because we're talking about tapping into people's discretionary income. And if they have less discretionary income, they are going to spend less on comics, which means they're probably going to be spending less on your comic. But there are things that you can do in your comic book business that don't actually cost you very much money. Developing the story that are in your comics is something that you can do, and it's not necessarily going to be a expensive endeavor to do that. I mean, yes, you might take comics experience classes, you might buy some books on, you know, the craft and process of making comics, but A, those are tax deductible, and B, relatively speaking, those are not super expensive relative to like what your printing costs might be or attending a convention. Um, building a community, whether it's online or offline and doing that kind of marketing is also something that doesn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money. And it's something that you can do because at that point you're looking at capturing attention. You're not looking at capturing money. So attention is something that even in a recession, you still can tap into people's attention. Um, so that's something, those two things, your story and your community are something that you can actually build on when times are tight. So when money is more flush and there is more discretionary income, your company is already set up to tap into that as opposed to trying to make money in a lean time when there's not much money to be made. And then when there's a lot of more money to be made, you're not in a position to do it because you don't have the, your stories aren't as good as they could be. And your target market, your community is not as big as it could be. So you have to, when the macroeconomic situation calls for building up those other two things, do that. When it calls for, you know, shifting gears and selling as much backlist as you, as you can, you do that. And that's how I think you can keep pace with the economic times and still move your comic book company forward. Let me if that makes sense. It makes a ton of sense. And and I hadn't thought of it in those terms about those three elements, but that's actually, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you said that because it, it gives me a little bit more confidence. That's that's what we're, where we're shifting our focus, which is not to say we're not trying to sell books, but we made the decision to cut back a little bit on the amount of number new number ones we're putting out um, just because there's just not that much money in the market right now. So we're going to put out fewer fewer number one issues that gives us a, the ability to focus on those that we are putting out hopefully bump those sales up a little bit more from what they would be um but yeah we're we're trying to build our build our community and build our relationships with retailers with with customers with different parts of the parts of the industry i mean that's that's exactly where our shift has gone and hopefully it'll hopefully it'll pay off once uh once the economy stabilizes or whatever it's going to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah because now is the time to actually make those connections with retailers make those connections with um buyers make those connections with creators who you know when things when you may have more cash to actually spend on hiring people you can go out and hire them because you already know them you already have that relationship and it'll be easier to get those deals done because you use, you're use you using the time wisely in the way that it can be used, which is what we're going to try to do when you're in Chicago and I'm in Orlando. So the next time we act, you and I actually talk will be after those conventions. So we can reconvene and I try to figure out how successful we were or were not in these endeavors. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, then that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Comics Connection podcast. Like I said, all of the links for all the things we talked about are going to be in the show notes, along with links that you can use to visit comicsconnection.net to join our Discord, get access to our classes, and the books that we have 
on building your comics career. So until next time, enjoy yourself and have fun with your comics. See you for Thank you. You too, sir. <laughs>